Welcome to Season 4 of E-Commerce Fastlane. This podcast helps resilient entrepreneurs thrive with Shopify. And now on to Episode 174. You're listening to E-Commerce Fastlane, the podcast show to help you build, manage, grow, and scale a successful and thriving company powered by Shopify. Listen to real conversations with partners and subject matter experts as they share proven practical strategies, platforms, and the best Shopify apps to help you accelerate your business. The time is now for you to improve efficiencies, grow revenue, profit, and lifetime customer loyalty. Please welcome your host, startup founder and strategic advisor, Steve Hutt. Today's podcast is sponsored by Frontend, a powerful storefront solution from the team at Shogun. If you're tuned into the e-commerce space, and you likely are since you're a subscriber here at e-commerce Fastlane, you've no doubt heard about going headless or building a headless commerce storefront. And if you've gone as far as exploring some of these headless solutions, you know there's an incredible amount of info to wade through and to consider when making a storefront pivot. You may have heard that headless commerce means a move from a commerce-led to a content-led solution, or maybe you've heard that it represents a lean-in more towards an API-first approach. Either way, as with any largely unchartered territory, it can be hard to work out what's growing faster, the technology or the terminology. The great thing about headless commerce is that it can get your Shopify store to load incredibly fast, eliminate the compromises when it comes to your brand's look and feel. You get full front-end control and flexibility, which will help you convert more of your website visitors. Amazing brands like Groove Life, Nomad, One Blade, and so many more have taken their storefronts headless using Shogun's front-end platform. You can increase your conversion rate with a less than one second page load. And more importantly, you can empower your e-commerce team to manage content more efficiently with Shogun front-end. They truly are the next generation in e-commerce experience platform. Request a demo and uh, see what the front end can do for your Shopify brand. You can check them out at getshogun.com. That's G-E-T-S-H-O-G-U-N, getshogun.com forward slash front end for more details. Well, hey there, it's Steve, and welcome back to the e-commerce fast lane podcast. Now, this is your first time listening. This is an e-commerce show where we have honest and transparent conversations about building and thriving with your store powered by Shopify or Shopify Plus. If you're an ambitious, lifelong learner, you're definitely in the right place today. Now, new episodes are available twice weekly with your favorite podcast player like Apple Podcast, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, and many more. You can also stream current episodes, including a very relevant back catalog, directly from ecommercefastlane.com. Now, in today's episode, my guest is Laura, who's the CEO and co-founder of a company called Shippo, and they're building a shipping platform literally for the 21st century kind of e-commerce brands and entrepreneurs, and currently they're helping over 100,000 businesses. They get real-time shipping rates. They can print labels. They can automate international paperwork. I'm sure we're going to dig into internationalization for sure. Track packages. They facilitate returns, even like international returns. Very interesting, very robust platform. They really are a multi-carrier platform, I might add, too. What's interesting is they connect to over 60 different types of carriers, and they are helping Shopify brands really to navigate a lot of the complexities that go along with shipping, and they are just really a great partner with Shopify. I believe they're a Shopify Plus technology partner, and so they have the the reliability and the scalability to really help the biggest, baddest brands out there, then also the small startups, too, so they kind of work in all areas. So hi, Laura. Welcome to e-commerce Fastlane. Hey, thanks for having me today. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, my pleasure. So I mentioned a little bit at the top of the show, but it's always best to hear it in the founder's own voice about the problems that you're solving. So maybe you can share a little bit on the high level first and then talk about kind of what led you to launching the Shippo company. Yeah, of course. So when my co-founder Simon and I started this company, we actually started off with a totally different idea. The two of us know each other from, from college and 
we had always brainstormed uh, different business ideas to potentially build. And at some point we were just like done brainstorming. We could never find an idea that was exciting enough. And we decided to just like keep it simple and built an e-commerce business. We got excited about that. We started an e-commerce store that was meant to be a site project. And building that e-commerce business, we realized pretty soon that first of all, you've got really good technology provided by, by Shopify, by Stripe, by a variety of other companies that make it really easy for a new merchant to get set up. But then when it came to shipping and when we had our first orders coming in, we were quite annoyed by that experience. We had to uh, walk to the post office, understand shipping rates, shipping options. We couldn't find like calling the different shipping providers was was not useful either. Shipping rates were difficult to compare. So that was just hard, harder than expected and um, harder than we thought it should be. And um, from there, we we first decided to to build our own solution. We built something for ourselves and um, started then talking to other merchants to get advice and and realized that every other merchant was having the same problem because at the end of the day, uh, all e-commerce businesses need to ship as part of the business model. And um, we then decided to to pivot from our initial idea, our our store, the the e-commerce business, to just build shipping software for all kinds of e-commerce businesses. And that's what we've been up to in the last years. The product is, is fairly straightforward. Like we, the foundation of it is a, a network or like an abstraction layer that connects to all different shipping providers. So as you as you said, we're a multi-carrier technology. We want to have the largest largest network of shipping providers in the world. And we, so that's our foundation, making sure that you can ship with any shipping provider that you're looking to ship with. And then on, on top of that, we're building uh, value-added products that our customers can use when they encounter shipping-related challenges, because shipping is really a workflow. It starts from pre-purchase around showing the right shipping options at checkout, having flat rate shipping, then it goes into data and analytics, international shipping. Then post-purchase, it's about tracking and returns. So it's it's much more than just buying a single shipping label. It's it's an end-to-end process that needs to be figured out. That's what the platform does, like really making sure that shipping is uh, meeting customer expectations, consumer expectations. And the goal is to build a, a modern shipping platform for uh, 21st century e-commerce companies. Well, it's very clear, obviously, with, you know, 100,000 or more customers that are using your platform, it obviously has product market fit. <laughs> it's obvious. I'm going to call it the great pivot, but it's it's interesting because that's what I find a lot of founders do. A lot of times software is purpose built for their own problems and their own needs, but then they find out that all of a sudden there's much more value on a wider scale and just with the massive growth of e-commerce in general over the last 10 years and certainly the last couple of years even through the pandemic it's just been out of control and now there's no signs of it slowing down at all and so pretty amazing that that's kind of where where you've headed and congrats on that sort of success let's talk about the shipping like as a challenge because i think i think when early stage companies i think we talked in the green room before recording today but it, it's funny where even in my own company I was in the optical space selling contact lenses and eyewear. You know, we literally took over three or four bedrooms in one of my co-founders' house and put a bunch of racks up and started doing our own self-fulfillment. I think that's the early part of that. But let's talk about some of the frustrations that can happen today in shipping and then how Shippo is, I guess, solving a lot of those challenges as it relates to, I almost outside the customer experience, but it really is. It's an important part of the puzzle. Someone's made a decision to buy something from you. What happens next? And and then like, what are those challenges? And then how are you fixing those challenges? Yes. So it is, a, it is really a, a, an interesting and a, a question because I, I'd say it starts with before someone has decided to buy something from you. When a customer comes to your website, they're they're for sure being they're aware around like shipping options, shipping rates. Even before someone's decided to buy, you can have already influence their their buying decision by uh, advertising like free shipping or maybe free shipping uh, above a, a certain like cart threshold. So for example, free shipping if you buy more than twenty five dollars, more than fifty dollars, and I, I see a lot of our merchants do that very successfully. So the shipping related questions start before someone has has decided to buy, and then if someone gets to checkout, they really they want to see the right shipping options. Amazon Prime has taught us that we expect free and fast shipping. Not every e commerce business needs to offer free and fast shipping, but I think they they should offer just multiple different shipping options for customers to opt into their different preferences. So free shipping should be offered, but then free shipping might take longer. 
does not need to be next day or, or two day free shipping. And then if, if a customer needs it immediately and needs it tomorrow, that should be an option, but uh, for, for a certain cost as well. And uh, really allowing customers to opt into wh- whatever preferences they have. To summarize that, it's really about using shipping to get a customer to buy, or at least to not block the buying decision. And then after someone's bought from your store, the merchant needs to figure out, first of all, like which shipping provider to, to like, that there's some picking and packing involved. So you need to like be someone in the warehouse or in the living room, wherever they store their packages, need to get the right products into the box. And then they need to figure out which shipping provider to buy a label from. And then it's about connecting to a variety of different shipping providers, understanding which one's the best for this particular package and this particular destination, getting the right label. And then I I do want to add here, shipping takes a certain amount of time, but fulfillment also takes a certain amount of time. So if you told your customer that the package is going to arrive in three days, then you you need to get a a label that uh, gets it there within three days. But you also need to make sure that the, the fulfillment time is not blocking you. So you can't like obviously can't wait a week to ship told the customer it's going to get there in three days. So that's part of the process. And then after you've shipped your package out, the work is is not done. Consumers expect tracking updates. They want to know where their packages are. And ideally, you can send those tracking updates automatically because otherwise consumers are going to write in and ask about that. And then you have more work to do doing answering emails. And then let's say for whatever reason, the customer is, is not happy or wants to exchange something, return something, then uh, return is, is the, re- the final step giving a customer a return label or, or having a clear return policy, whether you're the one to, to give them a return label, whether they need to pay for it, and then accepting the, the item back in return. I always think about surprise and delight when it comes to shipping, because I'm, I'm agreeing with what you're saying here about the, the kind of the pre-purchase considerations on a website about, you know, having the thresholds. And then, you know, like I said, the Amazon effect right now of wanting fast, but it's not always the case. One question I'm thinking out loud here is, do you find it okay with brands that make a decision to shop for the best carrier based on the size of package and destinations? I'm just, obviously, your software understands from a skew level and a quantity, potentially the size of box and kind of the weight and things like that and kind of know where it's headed off to. Do you find that okay to be able to have your solution locate the the most affordable rate? and then apply that towards it. And and then because I guess, I guess my one thought is, is that old school in my early days, we would use one or two carriers only because we felt it was easier to manage. Like do you find direct-to-consumer brands are using multi-carriers and is that a great customer experience overall for the support people, for the end consumer? You know, let's say they, they don't want to use DHL because the DHL driver leaves it at the door and there's porch pirates and blah, 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 blah. So how do you navigate around potential customer experience of different types of carriers? And then how about a preference of the customer and the carrier that they choose? So I think it starts with the market has become more fragmented in the last few years. And I I mean the the shipping industry. So there are more shipping providers out there than before. And we've got national, like we've got USPS, we've got the big ones, UPS, FedEx, DHL. We also have regional shipping providers that are now being used by carriers. OnTrack, LaserShip would be good examples. But then we also have startups entering that space. I saw that Shopify just did an investment in Swift, like a a Toronto-based a local shipping provider. And then we also have same day and next day delivery services, some on-demand delivery services as well. So the market has become more fragmented. And with that fragmentation, we see our customers, our, our merchants, wanting to use more different shipping providers. They want to know which shipping provider is more reliable, which shipping provider, they want to, to know which one can get it there faster, has the higher quality, cheaper, whatever they're optimizing for. When we see our customers do a multi-carrier approach, What's typically going on is that they might have different box sizes. They might have some packages that are smaller and more lightweight, and that would go, let's say, with USPS, and then they have bigger packages that they're sending out, but also they're offering different kind of options to their consumers. They're offering like slow and cheap shipping and then fast and like guaranteed delivery dates. And that again is done by different shipping providers. If they, like, they might even offer same day shipping, that's again done by a different shipping provider. And then if they enable their customers to buy internationally as well, then the international delivery is again done by a different shipping provider. So I, I see it to be like very beneficial to the merchant being 
able to um, use multiple different shipping providers, get some transparency around which shipping provider is best at what, and then just use the best carrier for whatever um, their preferences are. And then you specifically asked me about consumers. And um, that's an interesting question because as of now, we're seeing that the merchants are making the decisions which shipping provider they're using. They're doing that because um, they have a certain budget for shipping. They want to make sure that... um, consumers are satisfied, but also that it's not breaking the bank. What they're showing the consumers at checkout is typically not the brand of the shipping provider, but just the the time, how long it takes. Like the choice for consumers, do you want two-day shipping? Do you want five-day shipping and it's cheaper? Do you want 10-day shipping and it's free? Do you want like same-day shipping and it's going to be like $40? That's what consumers get to choose these days. That's interesting because I know on the plus side of Shopify, we have a lot of flexibility in there's a file called checkout.liquid and we're allowed to inject a lot of kind of dynamicness into there about what's being revealed from a shipping perspective and offering different types of options. Do you find that that's what a lot of brands are doing right now? Like that they, you know, based on maybe IP detection or that they are looking at what's in the cart and saying, hmm, okay, if there's these items, we can only have these carriers. We can only, we can only give the customer these sorts of options does it get that advanced or is it easier just to kind of keep it more basic i think it's it's easier to keep it a little more basic everyone talks about um ai these days but there's really not a ton of ai in in what we're doing or i think what's necessary to do in Mm -hmm. in shipping it's about setting up the right rule it's a rule-based system and then a little bit of machine learning in in terms of rule-based systems i think it's it's always like if a customer chooses two-day shipping then then X, then, then this particular shipping provider. If the customer chooses, if the customer choo- chooses two, two day shipping and the box is above a certain size, then use that shipping provider. So it's like these kinds of rules that can be set up. And then over time, it's, it's machine learning and, and like proactive recommendations where we can uh, eventually tell our customers that maybe they should consider another shipping provider because with their shipping mix, this other shipping provider would have done better. What we're seeing though is that some types of products can only be shipped by certain carriers. So that's a real thing as well. Like alcohol delivery, there are certain carriers that are best for that. Furniture or larger packages, but there there are certain carriers that are just doing that kind of shipping. So it, it makes sense that certain types of products should should go to to carriers that are specialized in, in those types of products. I see. Okay, that totally makes sense. I'll make sure I put some links in the show notes for those that are on Shopify Plus that may want to go down that journey. I think there's, you know, we have Shopify Flow and we have to have some scripts. We have different things, payment and line item scripts and that that can really help create a great kind of customer experience during the checkout flow and reveal uh, the right shipping options for the customer. Make it simple you know, also dynamic enough to be able to reveal what needs to be revealed, even payment options. So interesting. And then it gets into the international conversation, which is probably going to be another podcast. We'll talk about international shipping because that is, opens up another can of worms for sure. Yeah. You know, one thing that's interesting um, I find is the customer experience that comes with shipping and fulfillment. I think it's it's a super important differentiator, I think, in the marketplace. I mean, I talk to a lot of brands all the time and they realize the benefits of it. And, you know, on the plus side of Shopify with having access to checkout.liquid and really um, fine-tuning it, you know, with Shopify scripts, you know, payment scripts and line item scripts and then, and then shipping scripts for sure, being able to show and reveal based on what's in the cart. And so I think, and GOIP, you know, detections, knowing, hey, I'm shipping to Canada, I only use FedEx or whatever it is those those kind of logic can be built into shopify physically and revealed to the customer from your side of the of the the fence like how do you believe that that i guess fulfillment and shipping is a big differentiator in the marketplace and then how does your software fit into all of that because people really do you know i think customers want to be surprised and delighted brands are trying to figure out how to do that and they're kind of pickpacking and shipping themselves at home with some basic things that Shopify offers. I'm just trying to figure out how you enhance that overall experience. Yeah. So I think there are lots of different potential touch points where consumers buying from your store can be delighted by an excellent shipping experience. I'll just touch on maybe three or four different ones. So as you as you said, it starts with pre-purchase. However, I do think of pre-purchase, unfortunately, right now, we're mostly talking about table stakes. So I, I'm not sure, unfortunately, if consumers will be delighted by that. I think it's really about, you know, consumers want to see the shipping options that meet their expectations, both in terms of cost, but also in terms of 
transit times. And I think a lot of uh, merchants forget to to mention how long it's going to take. They just have a certain, I, I was just buying on a store recently myself, and it was a, a product that I, I really wanted, a product that was only sold in this particular store. And when I got to checkout, it was a, they, they said shipping was a certain price, but then th- there was no time. And I, I still bought it. I just didn't know, and I still don't know when it's going to arrive. And I think that's a bad customer experience. So you can offer like shipping at, at any price you want, but like it is important to tell the customer like to, to set expectations right. And I think setting expectations right is is part of delighting the customer. The customer wants to know by when the package will be there. And um, even if it's going to take 10 days, that's perfectly fine. Knowing that is better than not knowing. So yeah, setting expectations right up front, I think is very important. And then if if you are a, a store where you're going to charge for shipping, I think that is like even before a customer gets to checkout, that is something you can communicate as well with a banner where you say, you know, free shipping above $50. And then a consumer can just that they know implicitly that if you're, if they're buying less than fifty dollars, they have to pay for shipping. And then when they see that at checkout, they're going to be less surprised. The expectation is set. They're willing to to pay for shipping or willing to go above the the free shipping threshold. I think another point where unfortunately we we don't help, but a lot of our partners do help out is when a package arrives. Like it's really the unboxing experience. I think the unboxing experience is a really important factor of delight for our customers or our customers' customers for the consumers. They are excited to receive the box. They have received the box. And now opening it is a big part of the interaction. They want to open, like ideally the, the box is maybe even branded or has a sticker of yours on it. So when they see it, they know, they get excited, they know what's in it. Then they open it and it like the, the experience should be a you don't need to go overboard. Like not not everything needs to be custom, but I see smaller merchants have a lot of success with like putting a, a flyer in there or maybe even a handwritten note um, thanking uh, the customer for the purchase. Yeah, just uh, I think the unboxing experience is a, is a big part of, of delighting the customer. I should have said before getting to, to unboxing, there is tracking and tracking is another good way to, to set consumer expectations, right? So tracking, like there are multiple points in times when you want to tell a consumer that, that something is, is going on. You want to tell them, like, first of all, the package, the package has been shipped. It's been picked up by the carrier. It's been shipped. Then it, it's on its way or maybe it's out for delivery. So they, they know it's going to get there. If a package is late, that's something to tell customers proactively as well. Those are all good ways to, to delight your customers. And then I think the, the returns aspect, again, is one of these things where if you do it well, it will lead to repeat purchases. Consumers don't want to be faced with like obscure return rules and, and not be declined. Like maybe it's a surprise to them if they can't return it. If the experience goes well, they're more likely to, to come back and buy again because they, they know they can buy again without being worried about if, if something goes wrong, if they don't like it, being stuck with the product. Thanks for sharing those things. I, I I scrambled a lot of notes here. I totally agree with exactly. You're definitely on point here. The return experience, I think, is, is interesting. So how does Shippo deal with the returns? Do you uh, connect to partners? Like, you know, there's Happy Returns and Loop and Returnly and Narvar, and there's lots of kind of re- post-purchase experience return solutions out there. Do you connect to those or is there kind of a baked-in version inside Shippo that could assist with that more in a manual process? Yeah, so we we do both. So our product has a a return functionality to it where you can give your customers return labels. It is a a bit more of a manual uh, process compared to some of our partners. So uh, Loop Returns, Returnly are are two examples of of great partners who have built entire companies around only the returns experience. So they're doing a a much more thorough job there. Some of them, well, they're, they're in the loop of the payments as well. So being able to the payment back to the customer. I think Returnly is is even more of a payment solution than a than a return solution. Some of them have have warehouses where they can accept the returns for you. So there are lots of different ways. I, I see other companies where they've partnered with retail locations to allow consumers to go there and pull off the packages. Lots of different ways to, to solve this. The way we've been doing it so far is giving our, cust- our customers, the merchants, access to return labels that they can then send or make available to their customers. And then we're now also working on, on QR codes because um, we know that consumers many times don't have a printer at home. So printing the label is another point of friction. 
Yeah, and I think just based on the complexity or the maturity of the brand, and you know, sometimes returns is not a, a big issue. And if it's not, that they can be dealt through customer service and one off right through your platform, and then you know, and that's just the great workflow. If returns is like you know twenty or thirty percent of of your total revenue is kind of going in and out, then you may want to consider uh, getting involved with with one of the partners that just really double down and focus on that. So it's an interesting pivot though about the partner side of it because you do a lot of things really well. For from understanding what's being ordered, finding the right carrier and getting things all set up. So in fact, you're right after the or, the, the order is created, that's when you kind of kick in and then there's still the fulfillment part of it because you're, you know, you're more of a technology company that's helping find the right carriers and, and, and then offer the, the, like the labels and all these sorts of things. And I think that's a necessary part of the puzzle. So what happens in the rest of the ecosystem, like, you know, the three PLs or your own warehouse, or I'm just curious on kind of how you connect now that if, if you're the software that helps the carrier decision and the box selection and, and all that, and potentially some return processing, like how does the orders actually physically get out and do other, are there companies using your software as part of their workflow? Yeah. So the way we work with customers is in, in two pretty distinct ways. On the one hand, we work directly with e-commerce businesses. So e-commerce businesses can implement our, our software directly, either as a, using our dashboard solution or using our API. In those instances, they ship out of a location that they control. It can be their own warehouse if our customers are big enough. ASOP is a great example of running multiple warehouses and having connected directly to, to Shippo's API. It can also be out of their, their living room or their garage or their workshop, wherever they're, they're producing the products, wherever they're shipping out of, if they're smaller businesses. And um, that works that works pretty well for us and our customers. And then we also connect to our customers through platforms and marketplaces. So we can connect to them through uh, an inventory management system, uh, a warehouse management system, or even a 3PL is a, a potential platform partner. Or we partner with the 3PL or the, the 3PL is our is our customer. They integrate the API. And then all of the 3PL's customers are getting the, the storage um, and the pick and packing and fulfillment services from the 3PL. When it comes to shipping, the 3PL calls our API and returns the um, shipping label and puts it on a box for the merchant. And the merchant uh, does not even need to care about who is doing the shipping or who is the software provider because they're trusting the 3PL to make all of the right decisions. So so that is a, a great way for us to, to reach our customers and to, to amplify our distribution by going through platforms and marketplaces. And then like what, one last thing to add here is that depending on how big our customers are, we see them use different kinds of platforms and marketplaces. Like the, the smallest customers, the one-time sellers, they use peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces like Macari and OfferUp and Depop and all of those. And then if you are running a, a slightly bigger business, they're using a Shopify, a Squarespace, Wix or Weebly. And then if you're running an, an even bigger business, you need an inventory management system to manage all of your different SKUs and products. So they're, connect, they're, they're using inventory and warehouse management systems. And then as they become even bigger, they want to deposit their products into a 3PL. So that's that's when they switch to like a, a ShipBob or a Deliver, a Flex. And then at, when they become giant, they're so big that they have the economies of scale that they, they want their own warehouse and they're able to run their own warehouses. So it sounds like, you know, from what I understand is that, you know, early stage companies can use your software right out of the box right now and full fulfillment and you do it yourself and you're ready to roll. But as you start scaling up, there are ways of connecting to um, other 3PLs that could help with returns management. They can help with a lot of different things if you just don't want to focus on the physical pick, pack and ship portion of the business. Yeah, that's exactly right. And I, I think it's, it, it's very there, like the majority uh, or a lot of our customers, especially as they ship more packages, just becomes more complicated. They need to keep inventory and um, they want to make sure that they always have enough inventory. Leaving that in your in your house is just not possible anymore. So it's starting to look for a, a 3PL. And it's, it's easier to put that into a 3PL than to try to set up your own warehouse and to, to manage your own um, warehouse and, and workers there. So I think it, it makes a ton of sense for mid-sized companies to start outsourcing and using other services for for picking and packing is there any uh, connections to shopify at all i know they have the shopify's fulfillment network 
And I think these are warehouses not owned by Shopify, but they certainly allow our platform to connect to, you know, a different warehouses all across. Is that workflow a possibility with Shippo? Yeah, it is. I think so. Shopify, I, I believe, has been a little secretive around who, which 3PLs are a part of that network. I think some of the 3PLs that we power are a part of the Shopify fulfillment network. So that's, that's for sure a part of it. However, I think like as we go, like we really see ourselves as a as a software solution. So we, we don't need to be front and center in the warehouse. Like we really let our partner shine, and then we're the the software in the background that do the that figure out which shipping provider to use, connect to all the carriers, maintain the carrier connections, and make sure that the the shipping rates are reasonable. But yeah, we in those instances we see ourselves as the the infrastructure provider, where the the merchant really does not even need to be aware that that we exist as long as the shipping works. So I'm going to pivot a bit over to the listeners uh, that are on the show. I mean, there's like 10,000, some people probably listening to this episode right now, and they're going to be all over the map. Some people don't even have a store yet. There's going to be people in the mid-market, some people on the enterprise side. And I just would love, since you deal with so many customers and like, you know what great looks like, you know what growth looks like. I've read some of your case studies and it's so interesting. I actually want an optical, a bond look I just read recently actually before recording. So it's interesting. I have a lot of affinity towards optical, which is based on my past start. Up, but I would just would love to understand more from your vantage point. Like, is there any advice that you can give to brands today or store owners today? They're eager to grow. I know scale is a whole different level, but certainly eager to grow their business, you know, especially as it pertains to shipping. Like, what sort of advice can you offer today? Yeah. So I think when, when an e-commerce business is, is just getting started, I'd really recommend like choosing a <laughs> one of those shipping platforms up front because it's going to save you a lot of time. You don't have to walk to the post office or drop off your items, stand in line. Uh, all of that can be done over the internet. And even like pickups are, are free with most shipping providers. All you have to do is make sure you are in the warehouse or, or at home when the shipping provider is coming to pick up your products. I think also for, for e-commerce businesses who are just getting started, I Something that a lot of people don't know is that the shipping providers provide free boxes as part of their service, like boxes are free. So you you might want to get into customized boxes later on, but as you're just getting off the ground and validating your, your product or your idea, you might want to benefit from that and, and save some money there. As our customers start growing, or instead of sending out packages manually, see them setting up the right shipping rules, the so shipping automation rules to... to um, be able to process more orders at the same time. So all of that, as, as you scale, there are some of these rules that you need to decide and, and need to set up. Overall, like it is really about thinking about the, the three different touch points or three different points in your workflow of like pre-purchase, how do I make sure that the consumer buys from you? You don't have to offer free shipping, but what are the shipping options you want to offer? Then in the step of fulfillment, how do you make sure you have the right boxes? How do you make sure you get your package out in time? You should not take uh, more than one day to ship out a package. I think that is that is just very costly from a consumer experience perspective. You have to make sure that the packages go out same day or next day in the morning. Then post-purchase, tracking, returns. These are the, the three main steps where you can optimize. And um, tracking, I think at this point, is also table stakes, sending out proactive tracking updates. Returns is a policy to set up before you get your first return requests. So you, you don't want to do that ad hoc. You want to have it set up well in advance. I got a question around predictions. I think you have a good pulse on the shipping side of e-commerce right now. And is there anything that you might be able to share with our listeners today? Just kind of looking ahead, like we are at the end of, I don't know, we're in just starting in Q3 right now. People are always thinking about back to school already and they're thinking about BFCM already. So I'm just curious, is, is, is there any kind of takeaways that you can kind of share with us today about how people could just almost future-proof their business today as it relates to shipping? Yeah, so the most obvious one is, of course, that shipping expectations are only going into one direction faster and faster. So consumers are expecting free and fast shipping. Right now it's two-day free shipping at the, the standard set by Prime. It's going to go into the direction of one day and then eventually same day free shipping. And then that leads me to just the market becoming more fragmented for these kinds of different shipping options. You'll or meeting those shipping options. You'll, you'll need different kinds of carriers. Merchants should start thinking about using multiple different carriers, looking into same day delivery options and, and figuring out how to get ahead of that. 
I do think that if you're selling a very um, differentiated product, a product that you that consumers can't get anywhere else, you you might be able to get away with shipping that costs more or or takes longer. But but as long as it's a, like a, a, a generic product, consumers have they'll always compare and see other options where they can get free and fast shipping. In terms of transit times, I think or I hope we're going to see a, a world where transit times become more more reliable again. And I think if it's not done by the the shipping, the existing shipping providers, other shipping providers will emerge that can give you fairly reliable transit times, just because that that's what customers are expecting. I would say international is a big one, where like the internet is a, a global is a global place. You uh, see a store and you don't really know where that store is located or where the inventory is lo- located. So I see just like more global ship, more international shipping, the ability to buy from anywhere. And then uh, shipping providers need to find a way to to catch up and not become the blocker in that. So I, I think international will be will be bigger in the future as well. Speaking of international, I know uh, Shopify is, is, I guess, building or working on, uh, I think, part of their cross-border team. We know internationalization is a, is a very important topic and necessary as part of the next step. Once you kind of max out Canada and the U.S., a lot of American and Canadian brands are trying to figure out how they can get their wares around the world and having duty and tax compliance in the cart is super important. There are some different tools that can do that. I know Shopify is building something right now. And so there's lots of stuff coming uh, for sure in Q3 and Q4 that are really going to help brands grow and scale internationally and i know it'll be in partnership with what you guys are doing so because you're open api and our open api so it kind of works out really well together so we're nearing the end of the show first of all i gotta give you kudos um, i read recently about your funding round i guess it was 45 million dollars was raised recently ish and i just wanted to congratulate you on that i just wanted to talk about maybe the future now of like based on this injection of cash what does that mean for the company and kind of what's is, is there a new north star now what like where's the evolution of the platform I'm going to happen over time now. Yeah. So I think this the, the, the interesting part about Shippo or this kind of business is that it's a business that gets uh, easier uh, with scale. The more packages you ship, the it really fuels that uh, flywheel. And that flywheel just makes the entire business more more powerful and, and more useful for our customers. We, we start creating more customer value the more packages we ship. That's been really good. So for us, it's not about doing anything different, but just about doing more things faster. With the additional capital, with the scale that we have right now, we're able to start just like pull forward some of the, the product roadmap items that we've always been dreaming about and just build more functionalities and build them faster. So what that means specifically is we're going international, we're going into Western Europe first. That is in support of our platform and marketplace strategy. Most of our platform partners, they are already international and they're looking for for their shipping partner to power shipping, not just in the US, but for the majority of their customer base, no matter where their customers are. So um, becoming that largest network of shipping providers where we have access to any carrier around the world, that is an important part of our, our vision. That's what we're pursuing starting with Western Europe right now. Then we're, we've been talking a lot about shipping being more than just generating a shipping label. So we're building more functionalities in, in that vein from pre-purchase to post-purchase, helping our customers figure out shipping adjacent questions and problems and challenges that they're facing. That will help us then go up market as well. We've been very SMB centric. We're going to keep doubling down on SMBs, making sure that we're, we remain best in class in, in what we started out with, but um, starting to get some uh, increase in inbound customers who are mid-market and enterprise, and we want to make sure that we get to tackle that segment eventually as well. Um, yeah, we're hiring a lot of people all around the world. So we're looking to add another 150 people to the company this year, and I'm trying to do that as fast as we can. Well, congrats on that. I'm so glad we finally got to record this episode because I know you've been on my radar for quite a bit, uh, quite a while. I know a lot of brands that are using you. Obviously, there's 100,000 some brands that are using it, but every time I go into the admins, either um, in their private apps or public, I, I see you connected through an API and I'm like, okay, I, you know, this is the back end technology that's driving this company, huh? That's interesting. And so I'm glad we're able to chat today. And how can people learn more specifically about, you know, what Shippo can offer and can they read some case studies and just kind of let you open up the floor about where you want to direct some traffic today? Yeah, of course. So you can get more uh, insights about Shippo on Shippo.com. You can also follow us on uh, Twitter. You can follow us on uh Instagram, LinkedIn, wherever you want. We're an app on the Shopify ecosystem as well, so you can find us there on the App Store. 
we've also just released a, a report about uh, setting benchmarks. So that is a, an awesome case study or an awesome report on our, on our website that you can check out. Yes, what I'll do is I'll, I'll redirect that because I actually read that too before recording. It's, it's a pretty uh, compelling piece of content that I actually, it's funny, I have it shared on Google Drive that I have that I give to my merchants. And um, yeah, there's some really good info in there because this is very focused on what you do. It'll be ecommercefastlane.com forward slash shippo and that will redirect you to this benchmarks report for 2021. I think it'll just give some good insights of kind of what you're seeing from your side and how it could apply uh, towards your brand. So once again, I just thank you so much for for uh, coming on the show today. And, you know, like, I know you know this because you're really tight in the Shopify ecosystem, but Shopify is on a mission right now and really is to make commerce better for everyone. And it's very clear to me that both you and the Shippo team definitely are in tight alignment with wanting to help Shopify brands to improve efficiencies, you know, certainly as it relates to finding the right box size and getting great rates. And it's just, it's a lot more than just that. And I think that's what's great about your solution. It's this backend technology and I just appreciate uh, kind of what you're doing and I'm excited for where the future's headed and just thanks for your vision and just overall giving back to the Shopify ecosystem. Yeah, no, it's been it's been awesome working with the Shopify ecosystem, working with Shopify merchants. That's also where we started the company. Um, Shopify was our first channel. So it's been really great being a part of that and growing with Shopify. All right, Laura, well, have yourself an awesome day. Today's podcast is sponsored by Frontend, a powerful storefront solution from the team at Shogun. If you're tuned into the e-commerce space, and you likely are since you're a subscriber here at e-commerce Fastlane, you've no doubt heard about going headless or building a headless commerce storefront. And if you've gone as far as exploring some of these headless solutions, you know there's an incredible amount of info to wade through and to consider when making a storefront pivot. You may have heard that headless commerce means a move from a commerce-led to a content-led solution, or maybe you've heard that it represents a lean-in more towards an API-first approach. Either way, as with any largely unchartered territory, it can be hard to work out what's growing faster, the technology or the terminology. The great thing about headless commerce is that it can get your Shopify store to load incredibly fast, eliminate the compromises when it comes to your brand's look and feel. You get full front end control and flexibility, which will help you convert more of your website visitors. Amazing brands like Groove Life, Nomad, One Blade, and so many more have taken their storefronts headless using Shogun's front end platform. You can increase your conversion rate with a less than one second page load and more importantly, you can empower your e-commerce team to manage content more efficiently with Shogun front end. They truly are the next generation in e-commerce experience platform. Request a demo and uh, see what the front end can do for your Shopify brand. You can check them out at getshogun.com. That's G-E-T-S-H-O-G-U-N, getshogun.com forward slash front end for more details. Well, that's it for today's episode. I'd like to thank you personally for being a loyal listener of e-commerce Fastlane. It's my hope that this podcast is offering you a ton of value through growth strategies, tactics, and exclusive insider tips on the best Shopify apps and marketing platforms, all with my personal goal to help you build, manage, grow, and scale a successful and thriving company powered by Shopify. Thanks for investing some time today and listening to the show. I'm so proud and excited that you have a growth mindset and are a constant learner. I truly appreciate you and your entrepreneurial journey. Enjoy the rest of the week and keep thriving with Shopify.